Okay, chapter 21, The Furnace of Civil War, 1861 to 1865. Uh, this is the cool chapter where it talks about all the battles and all the events of the Civil War. Um, there's, I mean, you could take entire classes of this in college and just one or two years of the war. So this lecture is, we're, we're going to move quick and we're going to leave out lots of awesome detail uh, that you're going to need to find out on your own if you want, if you're interested in this. So it starts with the Battle of Bull Run. Both sides, the the North and the South, both thought that this was going to be a, a one battle war. They were going to spend a few hours, you know, punching each other in the face, and then eventually, um, one side would be the winner. At the end of the day, the South wins this battle. Um, July twenty first, eighteen sixty one. It's real close to D.C. It's only thirty miles southwest. Now it was a Southern victory, but it ends up being better for the North because the Southerners become overconfident and many of the soldiers just left. They desert their army and they go back to their farms. Southern enlistments also fall because again they think they've won the war and they don't really prepare as strongly as they were in the last few months for, for a long war. The Northerners they are shocked that they lost. They lose lots of confidence and it forces them to view the conflict not as a one-punch battle now, but as a protracted struggle against the South. And so they actually do start to make long-term uh, preparations for a multi-year war. <clears throat> there you can see the the march and how close it actually is to Washington, D.C. here. You can see over here, these are the, the statistics of the battle. The Union Army had slightly less uh, numbers than the Southern Army, um, and, and you can see that the, they're pretty close as far as casualties, except for captured. When the Northerners fled, the, the streets become so clogged that uh, with not only military, but with all those civilians, that the civilians had come to watch this battle, like had brought their picnic baskets and stood on the sidelines and, and watched the fighting. When the Southerners started to win, they fled in terror. The only problem is there's like one road back to Washington, D.C. So they all get clogged on this road. So the Southerners just kind of walk up behind the, the Northerners, tap them on the shoulder, and be like, all right, come on, dude, you're captured. Uh, here you see the what ends up being the Peninsular Campaign, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right. The, the Battle of Bull Run, in addition to being known as the first battle of the Civil War, uh, a big southern victory for the Civil War. It also is where Stonewall Jackson earns his mystique. Because in the early parts of the battle, the South was losing. And they were fleeing pretty much in all directions. Except for one guy. Um, and, and his name was Jackson. I forget what his first name is. Uh, but he's a Confederate general. And the other generals, they, they look and they see that Jackson's troops are the only ones that aren't fleeing. And Jackson himself is sitting on top of a horse just... You know, it's, bullets are whizzing all around him, and the North are unable to uh, defeat this guy. And so someone says, there's Jackson standing like a stone wall. And ever after that, he gets the nickname Stonewall Jackson. I think his first name was Thomas. Now, he becomes Robert E. Lee's um, you know, major supporter militarily where Robert E. Lee would give the toughest tasks to Stonewall Jackson, and Stonewall Jackson would always deliver. And flash forward a couple years to the Battle of Chancellorsville. There they win, right? The Southerners win this this battle. And at night, Stonewall Jackson's returning to camp, and it's dark, and he gets to camp, and he's actually there's a mix up of, you know, who said they're friendly, or they they peep, the sentries at the camp thought they may be being attacked, and so they just start shooting, and they end up shooting uh, Stonewall Jackson. He ends up, they, they cut off his arm, um, he you know, gets sicker and sicker and ends up dying of pneumonia a few days later. Upon learning of his death, Robert E. Lee states, I have lost my right arm and I am bleeding at the heart when he's talking about Jackson. So it goes to show you how much Stonewall Jackson meant to uh, Robert E. Lee. You know, we talked a lot about the fact that the northern army was filled with immigrants. And here's a, an actual picture showing that of an Irish regiment from New York City shortly before the Battle of Bull Run. Um, this is this would be mass, right? That would be a Catholic priest um, giving them the communion prior to the, the Battle of Bull Run. 
All right, the Peninsula Campaign, which I talked about. So McClellan, who'd you know like to train troops and never fight, um, is is finally forced to fight by uh, President Lincoln. And so here you can see here's Bill Bull Run right here. Lincoln eventually is like, you need to invade the South. You need to try and invade or attack Richmond. And Lincoln wanted him to go, you know, the direct route. McClellan though was too afraid, so he has to plan that he would boat the troops down the Potomac and that he would land right here actually by Yorktown. It seems like this is a very hot spot the first hundred years or so of our existence for battles. And then it forms basically like a peninsula, right, between the, the Rappahannock and James Rivers. Now consequently right here is Jamestown. So there's really, there's a lot of history just in this one little uh, area here. And then here's Norfolk, Virginia right down here, and then there's Virginia Beach even a little bit lower below that. So there's a lot going on in this area. In any event, so the the Northern Army lands here. It takes them forever to siege Yorktown. You can see an entire month, even though that the North had lots more troops. And then there's a series of battles that all take place here. The thing that's sad if you're a Northerner is that these are all red stars, and the red stars mean Southern victories. So Robert E. Lee basically beats the crap out of uh, McClellan and pushes McClellan's troops all the way back to the sea, where, with their tail between their legs, they boat their butts back to Washington, D.C. All right, the, what was the northern plan? The northern plan, it's called the Anaconda Plan. This is the grand strategy. And it was to slowly suffocate the south by blockading its coasts. So you're going to have a naval blockade to liberate the slaves and undermine the southern economy. And this is you're going to see that you know Tecumseh Sherman ends up doing that. Seize control of the Mississippi River and cut. That's a misprint or a typo. Cut the Confederacy in half, thereby cut off you know Arkansas, Texas, uh, and another state. Uh, and you'll be able to control the river to to flood the South with supplies and troops to to attack them. Chop the Confederacy in pieces by sending troops through Georgia and the Carolinas. Again, Sherman is, is a major portion of this. Plan. And then possibly the most important aspect was to decapitate the South by capturing Richmond, to try and capture the enemy capital. And this is where the South or the North was terrible at that number five. You know, the, the other four they they did a pretty good job with. It was very late in the war when they were actually able to march through Georgia, but uh, capturing Richmond it took them right up until the very very end of the war before they were able to do that. Despite the fact that Richmond is so close to D.C. All right, the war at sea. <laughs> You gotta know about the Merrimack and the Monitor. Uh, the Merrimack, it was a southern wooden warship <clears throat> that the southerners basically put old railroad rails, so the, the iron railroad rails, or steel railroad rails, let's just say, on the sides of it. It made it extremely top heavy. Uh, it actually could not uh, function in the open ocean. It could only stick, in, stick around in harbors and bays and stuff like that. Um, they renamed it the Virginia, but it started to sink Union ships. Union warships, you know, they would shoot their cannons at it, and they couldn't hurt it. And meanwhile, it could just get really, really close and then shoot its guns and then blast through the, the wooden hulls of the, the northern ships. The north responds with the monitor. It's a very small uh, ironclad, so this was built, you know, out of iron. It's just not plated with iron. And it ends up fighting the Merrimack for four hours straight on March 9th, 1862. The two are just, they're just lobbing cannonballs at each other, but they're just denting each other's armor and then rolling harmlessly off. They fought each other to a standstill, neither one causing any serious damage to the other one, and so they eventually both leave. So at the end of the day, it's a, it's a useless, tiny little battle between two boats. But militarily, it's epic because it ushers in the end of the wooden warship. It clearly shows that future navies have to be built out of iron or metal, and wood just doesn't work anymore. This shows you the map of the naval blockade, and you get to see some of the, the battles that are occurring up here. Sherman's March to the Sea, uh, Ulysses S. Grant kicking butt over here, but it, it just goes to show you where the major battles were fought, major theaters of the war are on the Mississippi River, the heart of the Confederacy, and then obviously all this area here in northern Virginia. All right, the first big battle we're going to talk about is going to be the Battle of Antietam. It ends up being the bloodiest single day in American history. 
August of 1862, Robert E. Lee invades the North. Uh, he goes into Maryland. The idea is that Maryland, which was a slave state, that they would be despondent with the, the North because it looked like the North was losing. He had these Southern soldiers who were going to march into Maryland, and it's going to entice Maryland to secede from the Union. Uh, luckily for the Union, so a Northern soldier f discovers the plans for attack uh, wrapped in some cigars he found in a, an abandoned camp in the forest, and those plans make their way up to George McClellan. And so McClellan is able to usher his forces uh, to stop Lee. And they, they end up meeting at Antietam Creek, which you can see right here. It's a creek that flows into the Potomac. You can see for the most part, the northern soldiers are to the north and to the east on the battle, and the southerners are to the south and the west of this battle. There's going to be two major, or three major thrusts that happen during this, this battle. The first one over here, where you get the cornfield I'll talk about. The middle one over here, where you get Bloody Lane. And then the south over here, where you get Burnside's Bridge. Um, there's tons of information. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting battle to study. So, here are the statistics. It's the bloodiest single day in American history, 26,000 casualties. I have here the Confederates lose, kind of. And it's basically because they leave the battlefield but there was no clear military victory the south um, is forced to retreat past the Potomac again and into Virginia and this pisses off Lincoln because Lincoln wanted to finish Lee's army and they were the south was so weak as they were trying to get across the Potomac that it would have been a great uh, chance for the North to defeat the South there with their backs to the the Potomac, but McClellan's troops were also very tired and he was, you know, exhausted trying to figure out what to do to you know salvage the the cheap victory that he got, and so he didn't pursue Lee, and uh, as a result, Lincoln fires McClellan, and this is I think a picture of Abraham Lincoln actually firing General McClellan right right there in front of us. Okay, so here's the. I'm going to really quickly go through the, the phases of the battle here. So, the first phase of the battle, the Union sends 10 brigades from the North Woods, there's this, this forest um, north of town, against our guy, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, there was this cornfield, and if you go to Antietam, you can still, they still grow corn in this cornfield. Um, the, the Union fights to a standstill, and it's nuts because corn provides great visual cover, right? You can't see. However, the you know it's it's not going to stop any bullets. So the, the this cornfield just becomes a huge slaughter zone for both the north and the south. In that you know the, the the different southern soldiers and northern soldiers they're going up and down these rows of corn and they start shooting each other and these guns are causing lots of smoke and so eventually nobody can see anything and a lot of southerners are accidentally shooting other southerners and northerners are accidentally shooting other northerners and by the time this phase of the battle is over. Um, it was said that, that the, the cornfield was completely cut down. And you got to remember, this is September, so the corn is well over six feet tall at this time. So it was just as closely as it could have been done with a knife, is the end quote. Uh, so the, the North wins this phase of the battle, and they push them across, it's kind of like a road, <clears throat> and into the, the woods. The West Woods, right? Closer to the Potomac River. So this is the West Woods right here. This is the North Woods right here. This is the cornfield right here. So the north pushes into the cornfield and then forces them into the west woods. Where you can see, thanks to the bend of the Potomac River, these woods are extremely hilly. And they kind of form a horseshoe bend like this. This is big, a big problem because what happens is the north uh, follows the southerners into these woods. The southerners go right over the, the crest of this horseshoe and they hide there. And then once the northerners get into the middle of this horseshoe, Stonewall Jackson pops up and says, attack. And so 2,500 northerners were killed in less than 20 minutes. It was an absolute massacre kill zone there. This is the edge of the cornfield. I think this is the cornfield here. You hop the fence, you go over here, and then here are the west woods over here, if I remember right. It's, this is one of the iconic pictures of the Civil War. This is the first war where we have photographs, and it really brings it home to the civilian population how awful war is. Right? I mean, you could read about you know the Battle of Saratoga in a paper weeks afterwards, or Yorktown and stuff like that. 
it's not going to be the same as seeing actual photographs. It really brings the battlefield close to the American population, and these pictures last forever. You know, it gets even worse uh, for the American population once we get to World War II, where there's movie footage of it, and then obviously Vietnam, there's TV footage. You know, every night on the news. All right, the second phase of the battle. So up here, you have the cornfield. So we already talked about that. Now we're shifting south a little bit. And there's what's called the sunken road. This is the, the main thing here. So for hundreds of years, horses and carts, right, and farmers have been using this one road to try and get their farming goods, you know, probably to Antietam Creek or to the Potomac River. And here's the town of Sharpsburg right here. Because of this and because the road wasn't asphalt or um, cement, it had, you know, sunk. And so it's probably about 8 to 10 feet lower than its surrounding land. And the surrounding land, of course, um, is when you had a couple different farms. Mama Farm, Roulette Farm, and Piper Farm. All kind of their properties met up at this. And so in order to keep their livestock on their own farm, they built these wooden fences like you saw in the last picture. So on either sides of the sunken road are these wooden fences. And this becomes an absolute kill so as well. So here in the second phase, the Union forces veered south towards the sunken road. The Confederates poured heavy fire into them, and they fell back. The Southerners hid in the southern road, and they used the wooden fences to rest their rifles to shoot at the northern soldiers. And the Union just sent wave after wave after wave. Um, as the battle raged, Confederate uh, General Anderson's five brigades reinforced the Confederates at the sunken road. Eventually, the Union forces advanced, and they got to one end of the the southern of the sunken road. I think I think here, if I remember correctly. And you know, the uh, one of these sunken roads is basically like a trench, and a trench provides great defense until the enemy gets to one end of the trench and then you can just it's like shooting fish in a barrel because you just aim down the trench and you can kill everything in there and the people in the trench are trapped so that's what eventually happens to the southerners so firing down the road the union soldiers raked the confederates with numerous volleys killing many surviving confederates retreated toward the town this resulted in the sunken road becoming known as the bloody lane There's an actual photo of the sunken road in the aftermath of the battle. And you can see the Confederate dead littering the, the, the road here. These would be, if I can remember correctly, um, they were slaves in Maryland who were, you know, they got the job of dragging the dead out of the, the lane and then burying them in mass graves. It was said by one of these guys that you could walk the entire length of the sunken road without ever stepping on dirt. All you do be doing is stepping on dead bodies. There's another picture, clearer picture of the sunken road, a different uh, different spot. Let's see what what a grisly job this would be. Here are the remnants of that of the wooden fence on either side. It was nasty business. Okay, the third phase, the last phase is uh there's to get over the creek there was really only two spots and the north only originally knew of one spot and that was there was a bridge right there's actually a ford right here a ford is like a very shallow uh, area of the creek so in order to get their soldiers across the north kept trying to go over this bridge problem for them is that right here is a huge hill wooded hill and uh, a bunch of dudes from georgia so southerners dug like little foxholes in this hill and then they just kept shooting at this bridge. And eventually this bridge gets filled with uh, dead northern soldiers and then live northern soldiers couldn't get over the dead northern soldiers and they, it just kept making a bigger and bigger obstacle until finally when they find this, this shallow place to, to get around. This essentially ends the battle because if you think about it the north has the the the, the western portion here over Bloody Lane, and then over here the southern portion as they get across the bridge, so they almost completely surround uh, Sharpsburg, where Lee's headquarters were, and so Lee and the other southern soldiers are forced to retreat. This is a photograph of that bridge. I think this is in the background here, that hill that I was talking about. This is another, this is a I think an artist's rendition of it, but here you can see the uh, the hill. So it's just it's going to be rough business getting across this bridge. All right, so Lincoln had been waiting for uh, 
a, a victory of some sort in order to change the nature of the war. Remember, the, the war was originally fought to preserve the Union. They said that the South illegally left the Union, and really they didn't leave at all, and that he was only trying to fight the war to preserve the Union. And remember, as part of his election speech, he would say that, that slavery would be protected where it currently exists. Well, this now changes. He's going to change the nature of the war. So in the aftermath, so January 1st, 1863, Lincoln issues what's called the Emancipation Proclamation where he frees all slaves in areas currently in rebellion. Now, this sounds fantastic, but in reality, all it is is political. Because in reality, it frees nobody. The border states that remain loyal to the Union, their slaves, they remained in slavery. Slaves who were in areas who were currently in rebellion, well, they were not freed because there's, there's no way that the plantation owners are going to hear about this and say, oh, okay, well, now I have to free my slaves. Because remember, they viewed themselves as a separate country. So no slaves were actually freed by this. The slaves were freed once northern soldiers invaded the towns that they lived in and physically went to the plantations and freed them. But it's symbolic and it changes the moral reasoning for the war and essentially tells Europe, and that's, I think, why you're tested so heavily on this, tells Europe that this isn't just, you know, a a legalistic battle between the North and the South. It actually becomes a moral one, and the North obtains the moral high ground, and so France and Great Britain are unwilling to support the South in the aftermath of this because their peoples had been free of slavery for decades, and they were not going to. It was not a popular public uh, uh, opinion in, in Europe to support slavery. The turning point. Is 1863, and there's a big battle that happens out on the Mississippi River, right at Vicksburg, and then obviously Getty, the Battle of Gettysburg. We got a new general now, General George Meade, and he is the general in charge of Gettysburg. Grant's out there doing Vicksburg. So the next summer, General Lee tries to do the same thing. He invades the North. This time he goes all the way through Maryland and he goes into Pennsylvania, and the idea was to go deep into the heart. Of the Union Army or the Union territory, and then perhaps attack Washington from the north, from this area. Meanwhile, he's burning, right, eating all the the crops from this area, and putting pressure on Washington to negotiate a uh, peaceful solution to this. Meanwhile, out west, you got Vicksburg. The Northern Army had controlled the entirety of the Mississippi River except for Vicksburg, Mississippi. Vicksburg, Mississippi is on a cliff right at a horseshoe bend of the Mississippi River. So any ship that's going north or south on the Mississippi River has to go extremely slow here. And that would allow southern cannons to absolutely demolish any boat. And because it's a cliff, it's very, very difficult uh, to attack. And so what Ulysses S. Grant ends up doing is just laying lays siege to it, medieval war type style. And so he starts laying siege in May 1863. No food can get in or out, and the Confederates are forced to eat their dogs, their mules. They actually start to eat their shoes towards the very end of the siege because they contain, I guess, some sort of nutrition in the leather. But on July 4th, that's a symbolic date right there, uh, 1863, Vicksburg surrenders. Because of this, the Mississippi River is completely controlled by the Union, and the second prong of the Anaconda Plan is now complete. With a complete control, cutting off of Texas and Arkansas, um, able to get northern goods north and south, and obviously then what's happening that same time period in early July is the Battle of Gettysburg. Here we go. Battle of Gettysburg. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and you can see there's, you know, it's, it's kind of an offshoot of the Appalachian Mountains a little bit. It's a lot of like low ridges and foothills and stuff like that. It's a very hilly area. And right here is the town of Gettysburg. And because of the terrain, all roads, all railroad lines, right, even all streams, they all kind of just lead to the town of Gettysburg. And that becomes a major component of this battle in that throughout these three days, the north and the south keep are, are able to let troops keep trickling in. So for three straight days, you know, you got some units who are fighting nonstop, 
and as they're weakening or dying, then all of a sudden there'd be another group of soldiers from their own side who would appear just in the nick of time, and which makes this battle so big and so long. Another thing to remember is the this ridge right here, and we'll talk about that. But so this ridge south of town, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, and the two cool stories that we talk about: Little Round Top, Round Top, and the Devil's Den. Day one. Northern forces have the town, and a cavalry unit right here um, starts to run into some southern soldiers actually by accident. And as a result of this, they try and maintain this ridge on the northwest of the side of the town, and they're able to stall the south long enough despite being vastly outnumbered, um, where the, the, the northerners are able to get their troops you know, from these different directions. And it allows them, once the north retreats, that they don't retreat in a route. They retreat in a, in a tactical retreat to the next area of high ground south of the city. This is the weird thing, too. The battle is fought. The southerners are actually coming from the north, and the northerners are actually coming from the south up here. So keep that in mind throughout this battle. So day two of the battle. This is fought now. The town of Gettysburg is right here. And then this is that, that area I was telling you to pay attention to. The northerners find themselves in the shape of a fish hook, on a fish hook shaped ridge south of town. Cemetery Ridge right here. Here are the two, the little round top, and there's big round top, and there's the Devil's Den right there. This is forms an, an epic battle that occurs here. Um, you know, I told you guys in class about the book The Killer Angels, which tells a story of a, of a few hundred guys from Maine, led by an English professor, and they are given the task of guarding this hill right here, a little round top, the extreme you know, left flank of the, the Union Army here. And General Meade believed that the main fight was going to be over here. What happens is Lee's main thrust is to be here. And the idea was to capture this hill. And if you're able to capture this hill, then you chop the trees down on top of the hill. You plant your artillery on top of this hill, and because this is the top, the tallest uh, area, then you can shoot your artillery all over the place here. And if you control the high ground with your artillery, you're probably going to win. So they just the Southerners just kept sending wave after wave after wave after wave uh, up this this little round hill, and Lee is sending just enough attacks over here, over here, and over here to basically keep them from being reinforced. So these dudes from Maine are the ones that they're forced to defend this hill all by themselves. Eventually, late in the day, they end up running out of ammunition, and so the English professor that was their leader uh, ends up telling them to just strap the bayonets to the end of their guns, and the next wave, they're going to do a suicide charge down the hill. And they end up doing that, little known to them. The Southerners were basically also out of men and out of ammunition, so they were doing one last wave up the hill. And so these two forces met mid-hill, and the northerners win. And as a result, the at the end of day two, the north still retains control of this hill. And what they do in response is they cut down the trees, and they put their northern artillery up there, and that becomes instrumental in day three. Okay, we already talked about this. And this... Here's a picture from the top of Little Round Top. You can go to the Gettysburg right now. You can take there's a bunch of tours, and you know you can go to most of the, the the highlights of the battlefield. But what the National Park Service has done is they've preserved as much as possible the rocks that the these dudes from Maine had frantically piled up to hide behind. And so if if one rock at the end of the day or you know at night falls down or something like that, they know where every rock belongs, and the next morning they'll put it right back to where it was. So you get a pretty authentic um, idea of what's going on in this battle. All right, day three, the infamous Pickett's Charge. So here you got here's your little round top up here. Here's the fish hook. What the Lee tries to do is he sends uh, General Pickett in a huge assault right in the middle. He's going to try and split the northern army in two right here. And the southerners are forced to, you know, I think it was over like a mile of just open terrain to march their soldiers all the way. And they actually do get right to the top of Cemetery Ridge. But the whole time 
right? All this artillery here is just boom, just raking them nonstop, and they end up the south south ends up losing, and as a result, that's it. No more battle. North wins. This is a clear victory for the North. This is yet another map. You can see here on the this situation on the evening of day two. Here's the little round top down here. And then here you can see day three. Here's Pickett's charge. And it was massive. All right. A lot of details of this battle. Union casualties were 23,000. It included over 3,000 killed, over 14,000 wounded, 5,000 captured or missing. The Confederate casualties were 22,000, of which 4,700 were killed, uh, 12,000 wounded, 5,800 captured or missing. There's one documented civilian death. Her name was Ginny Wade. Uh, she was lived in the town of Gettysburg. Uh, she was only 20 years old, and she was in her kitchen baking some bread when a bullet shot through, uh, I can't remember if it was the wall or the, the window, and shot her dead. Here's the disgusting thing. So this is early July, the, you know, the hottest portion really of the year, and you have more than 7,000 soldiers and over 3,000 horses who are dead laying on this battlefield. And it's hot, and they start to decay. And so the townspeople, as quickly as they could, uh, tried to bury them. And so they just basically just buried them wherever they, they laid. Um, but because they were in such a hurry, they didn't bury them deep enough. And then so throughout the, the rest of the month of July, it rains, and it rains, and it rains. And so these decaying horses and people, they start to emerge from the ground. And this rainwater, of course, gets into the wells of Gettysburg, and the people the, that lived in, in the town become violently ill, and they start to die as well. So this becomes just a, an absolutely grisly nightmare situation. And what the North ends up doing is they have to come back, they have to dig up all these bodies, and then they dig a very deep mass grave north of the, the city. And you can go there today and then in the fall. So this takes a, a, you know, a few months to do. So now we get to November 1863, and they have this, they're finished doing this business. And who comes but the president to consecrate this, the cemetery? And he does two things. He declares a national day of Thanksgiving. And that's actually where we get the, the holiday Thanksgiving. It has nothing to do with pilgrims or turkeys. It has everything to do with the Battle of Gettysburg. And that's actually where he gives the, the famous Gettysburg Address. These are just pictures of the dead. And you can see they're already starting to swell up. So they're decaying on the inside. And they they basically they, they just blow up like balloons and so one of the jobs that you would have to do is you had a basically like a a big metal stick with a pointy end and a hook and one of the jobs that you had to do is you had to poke the dead bodies to release the the gas because if you didn't they would eventually pop like a big zit and spray their goo all over everything fun job All right, the last stage, 1864-1865. Now, because Grant was so good out west, um, President Lincoln puts Grant in charge. And Grant was smart enough to know that he had more soldiers than Robert E. Lee had, especially after Gettysburg, and that he could give up soldiers, that you know, the, the South could kill two soldiers for every one of his. And so his strategy was ruthless. He's just going to find Lee's army wherever it's at. He doesn't care what type of land... He doesn't really even care about strategy. He's just going to try and kill as many Southerners as possible. And eventually it's a war, a nasty war of attrition, but it results in uh, the South finally uh, giving up. Meanwhile, Grant tells Sherman, rip the heart out of the Confederacy. So Sherman starts here in Tennessee in November of 1863. And he marches to Atlanta. And he sets it on fire a year later. And then afterwards, he just marches all the way to Savannah, Georgia, burns it. Then he keeps. Then he tries to meet up with uh, um, Grant, but by the, before he can get there, the South uh, gives up. 
So this is important because the southern soldiers who are up here fighting, they know that their farms and their families are in danger from back where they live, down here in Georgia and the Carolinas, because Sherman's just torching everything. What you see is, whereas McClellan and Meade were afraid to fight, Sherman and Grant were ruthless and were willing to engage in something called total war, which is, you know, attacks of not only the military, but civilians and factories and property and all that good stuff. This is a painting of Robert E. Lee surrendering to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia on April 9th, 1865. Uh, this is pretty much the end of the Civil War. Then, Here's your statistics for the end of the war. Total strength, the Union had over 1.5 million soldiers in uniform. The South had a little over 1 million soldiers in uniform. Wounded, the North has almost 300,000 soldiers wounded. The South, about 100,000. Those who died from their wounds, you've got... Uh, 110,000 for the North, 94,000 for the South, died from disease. You can see that's vastly more than died from wounds. In fact, it isn't until, I believe it's World War One, maybe even World War Two, where it's the, there was the first war where more soldiers died from battle wounds than from disease. And that was the first time in human history that that occurred. The death rate was 23% for the North, 24% for the South. That's a horrifically high death rate to, if you're a soldier. Total Civil War deaths compared to U.S. deaths in other wars. And we really, we need to we need to update this and add um, the current War on Terror because it's in the thousands as well. But if you add up all the other deaths from wars combined, it doesn't even equal the deaths suffered in the U.S. Civil War. Okay, Abe Lincoln. I don't really know where to put this um, because technically it was after the war and it's really in the next chapter even, but he's assassinated. Right? If Appomattox Courthouse is on April 9th, uh, 1865, and then you can look five days later, that's all he got. He got five days of victory and then he's blasted in the back of his head by John Wilkes Booth. He went, you know, went to the, the the Ford's Theater. This is a picture from Ford's Theater here. You can see this is where Lincoln was at. The stage is right here. In the infamous where John Wilkes Booth snuck up behind them. Actually, he snuck behind the crowd even. Went in through this door here, you can see. And then goes in, shoots Lincoln in the back of the head, then jumps down onto the stage. When he did that, his foot got caught in, in these flags here. And uh, when he lands, uh, he breaks his, I think it's his ankle or maybe a shin. Um, and he then hobbles away. Lincoln dies across the street uh, a few hours later. Yeah. Johnson becomes president. And then here's the last uh, slide. So you get the first Battle of Bull Run, 1861. You get the Peninsula Campaign in 1862. You get the, the Merrimack and Monitor Battle, 1862. The Battle of Antietam, 1862. You get He starts to write the Pro Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. 1863, this is when he ushers it in, on January 1st. You get the Battle of Chancellorsville, where Stonewall Jackson dies entering the camp. You get the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Vicksburg, within a day or two of each other there, right around July 4th. 1864, you get Sherman's March through Georgia. Uh, and you got then these campaigns here where Grant just keeps attacking, keeps attacking, keeps attacking. Lincoln wins re-election. He actually beats McClellan, who was the general uh, during the Peninsula Campaign, the guy who didn't want to do anything. You get Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse in 1865, the assassination, and the 13th Amendment. And that's